welcome to another episode of Your True North video podcast, a space filled with authentic talks about personal stories, a space where you can connect, explore, and let yourself be in awe of the human spirit. I am Yulia Farkas. I am your guide along this journey of discovering conventional, motivational, surprising, witty, or even persuasive personal stories. I have a special guest today. She, uh, their name is Emily Aspinal. So my guest is a lateral thinker and content creator making waves on LinkedIn with pro-autism educational content, Emily's biggest goal is to challenge misinformation, encourage neuroinclusivity and in the workplace and tell their autistic story. Emily is armed with 26 years of experience of being autistic and plenty of marketing know-how. Emily is sharing profound and personal insights and advice through the creative medium to help people become more inclusive to autistic and neurodivergent people. So without further ado, let me say hello, the proper hello to Emily. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Yeah, it's lovely to be on the talk with you on your podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much for agreeing to join me on this episode. Uh, so just to clarify, we will use the term autistic, sorry, holistic for um, anything that is not autistic. So mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what we will be using. And of course, we will maybe you will hear words like neurodiversity and neurodivergent. So neurodiversity, uh, from my understanding, was created as a term to describe a new movement to, towards neurological diversity, being accepted and respected in society. And neurodivergent includes those who also live with dyslexia, with uh, autism, with aid, aid DHD with uh, dyspraxia and maybe other neurological conditions. Did I say this right, Emily? I, I think it's almost there. It's okay. neurodiversity includes neurodivergent people, so people with different kinds of brains. So for me, an autistic one. Um, but it also includes people who aren't autistic, the holistic people. So the neurodiversity includes everybody. Neurodivergent is talking about the people who don't necessarily fit within the neurotypical, for want of a better word, um, way of being. They think differently. They're, they're, they're part of, I, sh I would, I'd struggle to even say a minority because I do think there is a heck of a lot of autistic people out there or at least neurodivergent people, but don't fit with society's expectation of um, neuro of the neurotype that we all share, which we don't all share clearly. Yeah. Yeah. So when we talked before, you mentioned that uh, for you, autism is a um, social disability. Uh, there and there are many people that definitely do not understand autism because it's not something that you can uh, necessarily see or uh, get a feel for you know it's not like let's say a speech impairment or a walking disability so please walk us through what autism means for you okay so big question i don't know <laughs> try and figure out where to start um I think mentioning, you know, I go by the social model of disability because um, what <clears throat> I don't see autism really as a disability in the medical sense, which basically means that there is a problem with the individual. The individual is somehow somehow has a has a difficulty that other people don't have. I believe we all have our own unique set of difficulties. And saying that somebody is autistic is referring to their neurotype, which is just a, a certain type of brain. So I don't personally see it as a disability, but I still classify myself as disabled. And that confuses people. They're like, why on earth? If you're not disabled, why do you go by disabled? And it's because society, in my view, doesn't make space for autistic people. And the social model of disability is referring to um, the failings within 
our environments, the failings within society, where where society is falling down, which is making life difficult for autistic people, because it doesn't have to be. I firmly believe that like we could fit in just as well as neurotypical people in the workplace, for example, given a few tweaks. Um, but I also went through this this phase of this internalized ableism of I didn't want to consider myself autistic. I didn't want to consider myself disabled because there's some sadly there is some element of shame attached to that and it took me a really long time to unpack that and figure out why on earth I didn't want to classify myself in a way that is accurate to me and it was just because you know I I, I mustn't be disabled enough to classify myself as, as disabled I can't be struggling enough to have that label I, there's you know you can't see it you can't you don't get the sense that I'm an autistic person because autism doesn't look a certain way. It doesn't necessarily sound a certain way. So yeah, there was a heck of a lot to unpack there, but autism for me is mostly a sensory experience. It's, you know, I think I posted on LinkedIn earlier. I was saying just, uh, uh, what was the, what was the post I put out? Something like, um, tell me you're autistic without telling me you're autistic. And the first thing that popped into my head was when I go into public restrooms that have got the hand dryers, when the hand dryers turn on, I start humming, you know, mm, like making the same noise as the hand dryer. And I was trying to figure out why I do that. And I think part of it is trying to mitigate the sensory input, trying to make sense of what I'm hearing in my head that ultimately it's, it's clogging up bits of my brain it's stopping me from being able to think stopping my decision making process my executive functions um because my brain can't get past the sound of the hand dryer so sensory things are a really big part of my unique brand of autism it's um it's anything from the noises that i hear to the smells i don't know if you've ever walked into the body shop or walked into lush somewhere like that and you just hit by the smell of soaps and perfumes and it's just whoa it's for an for a, a, a an holistic person I think that's probably kind of like you know my I think my dad often says you know I can't go into that shop with your mum because it gives me a headache straight away so everyone has experienced some level of wow that smells um but for an autistic person with sensory sensitivities that's very uh, jarring it kind of throws you off it, it, it it's it's using brain functions to make sense of the sensory input and that stops you from necessarily being able to do the other stuff that an holistic person would continue to be able to do um so yeah auditory uh, olfactory um all, all the senses basically even down to what i wear if i have a pair of socks on and that pair of socks is too tight I cannot focus. Like it is as simple as that. I need good pairs of socks in my life to, to live life. Um, so, but there is one part of the sensory experience that I think isn't talked about all that much when it comes to autism. I personally believe that emotions are an extra sense. So you've got what you smell, you've got what you taste, you've got what you hear. But you also have got what you feel, and that is massively under under talked about. It's it's it needs to be something we talk about more because autistic people sometimes will have difficulties with um, conflict. Um, they'll quite often be conflict avoidant. Um, they won't necessarily know how to deal with um, certain emotional situations. And that unfortunately has uh, a lot of people believe that autistic people are lacking empathy, which is not the case at all. In fact, I would actually describe myself as hyper empathetic. Um, sometimes it's just the case that I don't necessarily understand the emotion going on because there's a lot of nuance in interactions with people. So I might think somebody is angry when they're just tired, for example, it, it can be as, as simple as that. Like I've just taken what I'm seeing on your face, what I'm trying to learn from your body language and whatever it is, and I've misunderstood that. But that doesn't mean that I don't feel the empathy there. If I think somebody's angry, I'm like, oh, why? What? What have I done? Or um, what has somebody done to make you feel this way? I need to fix it. 
I'm still invested in other people and how other people feel. It's just that if someone is just tired and I'm going, oh, I need to look after you. I need to make sure you're okay. What's gone wrong? What, how can I help? That obviously confuses people quite a lot sometimes. So, um, so yeah, I, I think you've got your, your normal sensors and then you've got your emotional sense on top of that. And all of them can get a little bit confused sometimes depending on the input that you're receiving. That's autism in a nutshell for me. Does that answer your question? Yes, pretty. You gave a pretty, you know, um, descriptive, <laughs> very descriptive answer. Uh, and actually, my next question, you kind of answered it a bit, but maybe you can uh, shape it more. What was more challenging for you to learn compared to an holistic person? Mm. Um. One of the biggest challenges that I still face every day, like this um, last few days, my partner used the phrase on the nose. And I know what that means because working in copywriting, you know, I have to know idioms and, and, and just f uh, figures of speech. Um, but it, my brain doesn't necessarily straight away pick up on, on what a person means. And, and in a way it takes things very literally instead. So I went like that and touched my nose like what's on my nose oh you mean on the nose in the, in the figurative sense and I think before we started this call as well um you were using something figuratively you were talking about sunshine and rainbows and I was like oh yeah it is quite bright outside but you were talking again figuratively not literally so I'm still I'm still learning that I don't think it's ever going to come naturally to me um I think I'm always going to have a very literal side which I just need time for hindsight to figure out what somebody means and uh and yeah I, I still occasionally use that kind of language in the stuff that I write as well but um it does make things a little bit more difficult for autistic people sometimes when they do take things very literally and you also mentioned the um, the emotions part you know the the feeling uh, certain feelings and uh, mm. trying to to name them probably mm -hmm. this is also so basically yeah. you're trying to teach your brain to uh, recognize certain um, inputs let's say mm -hmm. certain uh, certain information that comes your way probably mm -hmm. this is uh, what you're trying to to accomplish it in certain circumstances in certain situations yeah i think the example i gave earlier was like not understanding how a person is feeling like mm -hmm. misunderstanding are you tired or are you angry i can't tell but i think that also extends to myself um and i can't remember what the name is there is an actual name i think it's something like alex thymia i can't remember off the top of my head um, but it's basically where a person struggles to identify their own feelings. Um, so say, say I'd got to the end of the day and I'd had a lot of sensory input. Um, say I'd been out shopping at a supermarket. I'd had a uh, lunch out with friends in a not COVID world, obviously. Um, and I've done lots of things that just required a lot of energy, like brain processing energy i get to the end of the day and something there'll be a trigger something will happen that just pushes me over the edge and in that moment i can't tell you necessarily what the trigger was or what the emotion is that i'm feeling because i don't know like i could be it could be angry and other people could perceive me to be angry but i wouldn't know that i'm angry i'm just you know, it's just coming out, but it doesn't have much meaning in my head at that time. In hindsight, I can look back and go, oh yeah, no, I was frustrated. And probably it was because the fridge was making this noise and that just pushed me over the edge at that point in time. Again, hindsight is key for me. And I think maybe for a lot of autistic people out there, you can figure out what was the problem after the fact. And hopefully figuring out that problem will help you take proactive steps to avoid it in the future. But in that moment, you just, I have zero clue. I don't know. So. But I think that what you're saying uh, is actually, uh, actually can be applied for any, any 
person. It's not something specific necessarily to autistic people or to holistic people. And you, mm. I mean, I think that uh, we, any of us uh, struggle at some point with uh, trying to figure out what the trigger was that something mm -hmm. triggered us and we mm -hmm. just felt overwhelmed in the mo moment and we couldn't express okay what happened what's wrong what uh, yeah you know? so it's not something that uh, uh, comes easily you need mm -hmm. probably it's a process of knowing yourself and um, trying to yes to observe actually observe yourself dealing mm. with certain situations and with certain circumstances mm. um you told I, me I, that sorry. sorry i would jump in and just say because i think you're absolutely right saying you know holistic people and autistic people can experience that that same situation of not knowing what the trigger was or not knowing quite what you're feeling that's entirely normal i think the difference is is that autistic people's triggers are quite different from holistic people's um and it might you might find that autistic people experience it a little bit more because there's more triggers to really consider mm -hmm. um but other than that i do generally agree with you that everyone can experience that yes probably the the sensory uh, perception is uh, more let's say acute in uh, yes, in definitely. okay mm -hmm. uh, you told me that you were diagnosed pretty late in life because uh, you were very good at hiding who you mm. were only to blend in with society and mm. you used the term for it you called it masking yes. what did masking mean for you how did it manifest exactly um this is always quite difficult to describe because masking can be different in all sorts of different scenarios and the only way I can really give you a, an idea is probably by giving you a few examples. Um, so I, I went through a process where I think it, probably it started around about 16, 17 years old. And it's it didn't finish until I decided to pull the plug in terms of diagnosis. Um, I went through working diagnoses of, or diagnoses, I guess, of, um, various mood disorders including bipolar disorder before we got to the conclusion of you're probably autistic and that is very difficult for someone to process especially at that time in life i i went through a lot of my young like uh late late teens early 20s thinking that i had a type of bipolar disorder called cyclothymia and that was kind of a, when I realized that that wasn't the case and it, it started, things started like pennies started falling into place and I had a better understanding of myself. It was, it was a very odd experience. So just because you mentioned the diagnosis process, I, I feel like that's relevant because a lot of autistic people do get misdiagnosed um, and that can go on for years. But um no matter what my diagnosis was, I was still acting the same way. I was still struggling with the same things and I was still masking in the same way. And that looked like, in the workplace, that looked like me having a different persona to how I am in real life. Down to my voice, the voice I'm using right now isn't my inner voice, which really confuses people sometimes. Like, how, how is that a thing? How can you talk differently out, outwardly, but your inner voice is something else? And the only people who can really understand it is the other people who I unmask around. So my partner, my parents, um, some of my close friends, and they describe my, my normal voice to be quite, quite childlike. Um, I put on a lot of silly voices and it feels natural. It feels like I'm a bubbly person. Usually I'm, I'm quite childlike. Usually I still enjoy childlike things. I like the fact that I'm not necessarily growing up in the way I see other people potentially pretend to grow up, to be honest, because I don't think anyone really grows up. Um, but in the workplace, that's not always expected or accepted. So I have to change uh, the way that I say things. I have to sometimes feel like I have to suppress certain stims. So I'm not doing it right now because I'm consciously thinking not to, but 
if you catch me on a good day where I'm just feeling myself and I'm not feeling like I have to mask or anything. Um, I do a lot of handshaking. I'm very, I'm a flappy person, um, which can indicate two things. It can indicate that I'm excited about something or that I'm frustrated about something. And there's, there's a trigger going on in the background that's making me have a, a self-stimulation response. Um, <clears throat> other masking can include, oh, not <laughs> forcing eye contact. I quite like having Zoom calls with people because I don't have to look at that person directly in the eye. It's great. If I started looking at the camera in front of me, I would feel really, really awkward. And I feel pretty much as awkward looking directly at the camera as I do looking at someone in real life. So I feel like everyone can relate. You don't want to look at the camera. That's how I feel about people's eyeballs. I don't, I don't need to look at them. I really don't. They're, they're yours. You have them. I'm all right without them. Um, I can't think of any other examples off the top of my head. They're, they're like the main ones. But one more, one more I've got is um, verbalizing. So a lot of people know me as quite a chatty person. And that's fine. I'm happy with that. I'm happy to chat at people. But there'll be times where I just can't. Um, it's usually, again, when there's been lots of triggers or lots of sensory input and my brain kind of, it starts prioritizing what it needs to do and verbalizing what's in my head is not one of the things that it prioritizes. I'll just, I'll just keep stum. And a lot of people probably go through periods of, you know, just not fancying talking to anybody. And it's good to like be... you save, you save up energy for other important yeah. or for a, a priorities. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's, that's usually fine. That usually is a okay until the situations where I need to talk and other people, holistic people can break out of their silence and just say what it is to get the job done. I find that difficult. If I'm in a position where I'm not verbal, I'm staying like that until something changes in my brain. And if I don't, if I force myself to verbalize, it makes things so much worse. Like I'm already at minimum spoons and I'm going into minus spoons by verbalizing what's in my head. Don't ask me the question, just make your best judgment. I can't talk right now, that kind of thing. Um, it's interesting, you said earlier that you cannot uh, look at people, you know, in the eye, uh, mm. but you know, they say it's the expression uh, that the eyes are the windows to the soul. How do you mm. get the feel? How do you get a sense of people if you don't, I don't know, don't make eye contact with them? How do you? <laughs> That's a deep sense? question. And the honest answer is I'm not sure. Um, I really don't know how to go about answering that question. I get a sense of people from some instinct that is built into me and I don't understand the science behind it. I, I don't find that I need to look at people in the eye, which is very awkward in interviews and stuff or when I'm meeting a client for the first time and I have to force myself to do it, but I don't gain anything from, from looking at people in the eye. I don't think um, I've ever felt I've ever felt that. I know it's like, uh, it's, it's a romantic thing for some people, you know, with, with your partner and you're looking deeply into each other, other's eyes. And I can't think of anything worse. I, I just can't. I, I, I look at the people who I'm closest to in the eyes probably more than I do people I don't know. So maybe it's, a, it's something that I find intrusive sometimes. If I don't know a person and I'm having to make the eye contact, it's a lot more awkward feeling than if I know the person really well and I'm making the eye contact. Then I, then I don't even think twice about it. Um, but yeah, well, I just, people are obsessed with eyes. I don't, I don't get it. I really don't miss, they're just eyes. Yeah. Um, and do you get your cues from the uh, non-verbal, um, you know, type of uh, <laughs> expressing themselves from, uh, from gestures or for, from uh, smiles or something like this? Do you? Yeah, the, the most obvious thing. So if someone's mm -hmm. smiling, I'll assume they're happy. Like that, that, that's easy level. That, but all of that's learned. Um, the more nuance that's involved, the harder it becomes. So one of the things that I, I learned probably in more recent years is diction, I guess. It's um, 
the emphasis that's put on words to make things sound sarcastic because I'm terrible with sarcasm. I'm really bad at it. When I started my job at where I'm working now, I, I was met with so many people who use sarcasm on a daily basis to be funny, to communicate. And it was just a done thing. And I felt like an alien. Like I had no idea what was going on and I didn't know how to engage with it at first. And it can sometimes be really difficult because I can take people so literally as we've discussed. Um, that I, I can start feeling really hurt by people like, why would you say that about this thing? Or why would you say that about me? When it, they're just, they're not meaning it. It's just that I've taken it as a, a, a literal way that when they meant it a sarcastic way. So picking up on, picking up on the sounds of words has been a learning experience and it, it, that I'm continuing to do to this day. And to give you an example, I'm trying to think of, oh, uh, trying to think of one of the things that my friends usually say that's super sarcastic. And the only reason that I know it's sarcastic is because like, oh, I, I tell you what, I absolutely love this, right? <laughs> okay, cool. You love it. That's great. I love it too. Do you actually mean that you love it? Or is the way that you pronounce the love, love, the, the curvy thing in that word, that is the indicator of sarcasm. And I didn't get that when I was younger and I get that now and I'm on the lookout for it now. I'm, 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 I'm listening out for it. The, oh, I absolutely love this compared to just, I love this. Just say what you mean. <laughs> it would make life so much easier. Yes, but still there are people who don't, uh, don't use their voice, you know, uh, the inflections of their voice in order to emphasize or uh, make a point, or, you know, yeah. probably that's a bit difficult to, a bit harder to read. When, yeah, there uh, are some people who deadpan everything, and I am terrible with deadpan. I don't, I, like, if someone deadpans something that's sarcastic, I won't pick up on it, unless it's so obscure unless the point that they're making is so ridiculous that of course they can't mean that in real life at which point something in my brain goes they probably don't mean that i'm going to assume they're being sarcastic but if it's something that's a little bit more believable it'll trip me up um the, i was also wondering do you uh i don't know feel feel uh people's presence do you sense them you might need to expand on what you mean. Uh, if they're in the same room with you, but I don't know, you have your headphones on or uh, something, do you sense them? Do you sense their presence there? Or do you sense when someone is looking at you? Oh, oh, having people's eyes on me. I can, I, <laughs> I, I guess that's a really difficult one because if someone's in the room, someone walks in and there's no like physical indicator. There's no draft that's come through the door and I have my headphones on so I can't hear anything. I don't know. I feel like someone could quite easily sneak up on me because I, I, I might not necessarily feel a presence. But as soon as you mentioned like people looking at you, something twigged in my head just then, something like, I, I know the feeling of having eyes on me in a place and the one example that I can give you was when I first started out at the digital agency I'm at. We went out for drinks <clears throat> and it was one of the first times we'd all hung out together. And we went to this, uh, this, this bar and it was getting on to the end of the night and I was the first person to leave. And as I got up, for some reason, um, everybody in the group that I was in started clapping. I had no idea what was going on. Like they were just very tipsy, being very silly and confusing the heck out of me. But everyone just started clapping from my table. And then the bizarrest thing happened is that people from the next table just started clapping because it was just the done thing. And then the next table, and by the time I got to the door, everybody in that pub was clapping. And I had no idea. I was just giggling and going bright red and just didn't know where to look. And as I turned my back on, on the group to, to go through the door and get into my taxi, I could feel the eyes. Everyone was looking at this person going, 
I wonder why they're clapping. <laughs> like it that was that was possibly one of the most embarrassing, but also one of the funniest moments of my adult life. But I can I can sense the stares. I suppose the the the, the thing there is that people are clapping me, so I, I would assume that they're also looking at me at the same time, but it was still very intense the feel like the knowing that everybody was all eyes on me as I was leaving. I like I think it put extra pressure on me not to like trip up through the door or something so that was awkward Ugh. um <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> probably i mean it's i think it's awkward for anyone to feel you know the like the eyes burning in the back of their skull you know mm -hmm. the, someone's looking <laughs> at them um coming a bit back to the masking uh masking mm -hmm. part um would you say that you recognize masking in others or do you also recognize masking in allistic people, which is, this is interesting. I mean, mm. not necessarily, you know, if they change their voice or something, but if you can uh, figure out that they're not who they, you know, who they really are deep down inside and they're just playing a part. Mm. Let me unpack that because there's two things that I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about right. from that yeah. question. Yeah. Um, can I tell if other autistic people are masking? So my gut says yes. My brain is saying no, but my gut says yes. And the reason being is that from my life experience, the people that I've made friends with, the closest connections I've had with people, have been other people who are autistic. Most of my friend group is either diagnosed with some neurodivergent element to them. Um, I have one friend who is dyslexic and dyspraxic and we, we also assume, and I think he assumes that he's on the spectrum. <clears throat> and, um, I have another friend who is autistic and he goes around the country teaching other people about being neuroinclusive in the workplace. He's a top notch pal. Um, all of these people I hang out with quite regularly and that's online and offline. And I think there's a, a social language, like we're on the same wavelength. We speak each other's neuro language for want of a better term we we get each other on a level that I don't think I've experienced with holistic people so if if they're doing something that's a bit out of the blue for them because I'll have seen them not masking I'll pick up on it um if I'm making friends with an autistic people, uh, on a, an autistic person that I don't know, I think it takes a little time to get to know a person, but I still think the part of me would pick up on an, the neuro language. I think I'd still feel a connection with an autistic person more than an holistic person. Like I'd feel, I'd feel on the same wavelength as them more than an holistic person. And then to answer your question about whether I see allistic people masking because that you know ev everyone has the potential of changing themselves to to fit into social situations I do see that all the time um and I think I probably pick up on that just as well as I pick up on on autistic people but for the dip for a different reason um because I've I've spent time watching I, I i'm a people watcher by nature i'll sit quietly in a pub and watch how people I interact with each other um and i've seen the, the the differences between the way autistic people mask and the way allistic people mask so and i like categorizing things as well so i'll have like a list of oh you're doing this and you're doing that tick 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 tick, tick in the same way as an autistic person oh you have this trait and that trait and you kind of seem on the same wavelength as me. So tick, 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 you seem like my kind of person. Um, so yeah, to, and to answer your question, yes, but I don't understand if there is a science behind it. It is just a gut instinct. Okay. Um, some people use the word spectrum to mm. describe various degrees or manifestations of autism. 
uh, but how accurate is this term really? Mm. So I don't have a problem with the idea of a spectrum. I have a problem with the idea of a linear spectrum. And unfortunately, a lot of people still apply this, this model to autism. They think over here, you've got um, an holistic person. And over here, you've got an autistic person. And everybody is on this spectrum, right? Cue, note the sarcasm there. Um, so the closer you are to this side, the more autistic you are. The closer you are to this side, obviously, the more allistic you are. And somewhere on there is your autistic person, probably closer to the end. Now, people on this spectrum would probably put me somewhere here because a lot of people consider, consider me to have mild autism because I can communicate in this way um, because I've had a lot of experience learning holistic methods of communication and holistic ways of thinking. But that doesn't make me any more or less autistic. I am just autistic. And the idea that everybody is somewhere on that spectrum is wrong because you can't have a brain, a neurotype that is just a little bit autistic or, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You either have an autistic brain or you don't have an autistic brain. And you can have what are considered to be autistic traits, but still be an holistic person. So a good example of this is within my family, there's probably a strong mix of allistic and autistic people. But because we're so close with each other and, you know, we spend time with each other, certain behaviours that stem from being autistic will be picked up by the holistic members of the family. And they'll probably do something that we do just because of the exposure to that thing. I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, but I hope that paints a picture. Um, but of course that can kind of confuse people like, so you do this autistic thing, but you're not autistic. Like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, that, that happens with culture as well. You know, you can, you can do something specific to a culture um, because your family has elements of that culture, but you're not necessarily fully immersed in it. And you, you're not necessarily from that specific part of the family. So you, I don't know, uh, one family from one country marries a family from a totally different country and they spend Christmas together. You're gonna end up doing something that is part of somebody else's culture. And it's, it's just natural. And I, I think autism is exactly the same. Um, and then coming back to the spectrum from a visual perspective, instead of having that line, there is, there's a, another model, and I can't remember who came up with it, but a very clever person came up with it. And it's uh, a number of points. You start from the middle and you've got, say, um, communication skills up here and you've got uh, sensory experience down here and something else, something else. And you work out how much of that thing you have. So you kind of end up with a net shape. Mm -hmm. And everyone's autistic net will look different. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a more accurate or accurate way of painting this instead of yes, nothing. I don't believe anything is linear. <laughs> nothing is linear. I mean, even our uh, our personal stories are in constant motion. You know, they're shifting, they're evolving, they're changing. Um, mm -hmm. What uh, what I admire is the fact that you are in tune with yourself with your emotions and that you you learn more and more how to uh, when to stop doing something when to step away from a situation that is causing you distress uh, when to say probably when to say yes or when to say no to something and i love the fact that you are able to connect with yourself in the moment and mm. of course i know this is a work in progress because nothing is perfect I was just and, thinking that yeah yeah it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a long way to, to go and to learn. But um, I know also that your journey is not, was not an easy one. And you told me something very interesting, an idea that um, you borrowed from someone, uh, which is also a beautiful metaphor, the, the jar with spoons. Please uh, share a bit about this. I think we can all benefit from, uh, from this interesting concept. So the idea is spoon theory. And the way it works 
is you have a, a jar and you have a set number of spoons. I think everyone's spoon count will be a little bit different. And <clears throat> each thing that you do, each activity, say having a shower in the morning as something really simple, cooking a three course meal would obviously be a little bit more involved. Each of those activities will take a certain number of spoons. And when you get to the bottom of the jar for an autistic person, that is when you need a timeout or it's when you're nearing burnout. It's when you, you could be nearing a meltdown um, if the spoons that have been taken are very sensory related. The activities are very sensory intense. Um, <clears throat> I think the idea of spoon theory came actually from uh, dealing with chronic illness. So it wasn't actually applied to autism straight away but it fits so nicely and it also makes communication so much simpler with like my friends and family. So my partner, if we've got a lot to do on a day, like today, for example, my partner's out walking the dog, I'm talking to you. I've got a, a bunch of other errands that we need to run, jobs that we need to do around the house. We've just had the kitchen fitted. So I need to Tetris everything back into the kitchen. <clears throat> and that's gonna be quite high levels of spoons to get through everything this weekend so if i'm getting to the point where i'm really tired or i just can't make key decisions in my brain anymore because my brain's getting uh cloudy because of everything going on i don't necessarily have to turn around to him and say you know i'm feeling really like i can't do this thing right now uh, you know, I can't communicate when I'm already at that point in time. And it's so easy to go, I'm low on spoons. And he knows, he knows exactly what I mean. I'm, just, I'm low on spoons. I can't do this right now. It communicates lots of different things all in one go. The reason why I've got to the stage, the stage that I'm at, um, the fact that I'm going to need to remove myself very promptly in I'm low on spoons. Four words, done mm -hmm. and dusted. So I really, I really like that metaphor. I do encourage other people to use it. <clears throat> it is picking up steam in the autistic community for sure. I see it a lot. Um, I like explaining it as well. Like it just makes life so much simpler. Um, one more thing, and then we can uh, we can wrap up our our conversation. Tell me about the dinosaurs. <laughs> what's with the dinosaurs? <laughs> what do you mean? What's with the dinosaurs? Do you what's not have di dinosaurs? <laughs> dinosaurs are great. Dinosaurs are my special interest. I love dinosaurs. Um, I'm always learning about dinosaurs. Don't even get me started on dinosaurs. We're going to need like three more hours. <laughs> so. A lot of autistic people have something called a special interest or they have multiple. And these can be hobbies, um, areas of, of learning. There can be all sorts of different things that are specific to the autistic person's likes. But we like when we like things, we really like things. Um, and that's actually fed into this stereotype that's out there about autistic people love numbers, they love science, they love maths. And that's because of the media portrayal of um, uh, autistic people. Autistic representation in mainstream media is very much boys who are really good at a specific thing like computer programming or um, I think another one is The Good Doctor is a TV show and it's about this, this young autistic boy who's uh, un, like not, you wouldn't imagine them to be a really good doctor yet, but because their special interest is medicine and stuff that, you know, it, it's a whole thing in the media, but it's not realistic. Like autistic people have so many different kinds of special interests and it's not just within the science and maths area. It can be in the creative area as well. And for me, my special interests kind of, they do land in creative and I do love my work for that purpose. Like I love trying to understand marketing and human psychology and how people think. And I feel like that comes from a, a, a an experience of, I need to know this for my survival. So now I've got really good at knowing this, I can use it in my career. And I got really excited about that. Um, but also uh, that and video production 
and graphic and all the creative things, there's also dinosaurs. Come on, how can anyone not love these things? Literal monsters that walked the, the planet billions of years ago and they lived for so much longer than we did and they had such a profound impact on the planet. It was, and it's so, and Jurassic Park, how yeah. can you not like Jurassic Park? Come I'm on. a big fan of Jurassic Park, actually. I think I've seen the first one, the first Jurassic mm -hmm. Park. I think I've seen it, I don't know, 10 times at least. I should it's... hope so. There's a lot to <laughs> unpack there and it's a very enjoyable movie. It is the movie I go to if I'm ever feeling poorly. I know I can put a Jurassic Park movie on and just feel good. <laughs> like, oh, I love dinosaurs so much. But, um, it's got to the point now where my friends know, my friends get it, they understand how much I love dinosaurs. Yesterday morning I woke up and one of my friends had messaged me on Facebook saying, check out this cool fact about T-Rexes. And it was this article about, um, was it T-Rexes or was it the thing that I read about uh, Triceratops not necessarily existing? It was something dinosaur related. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, that's really cool. Also, did you know? And then I gave them about 10 facts about <laughs> this particular kind of dinosaur. Like, did you know this? Did you know that? Did you know that the T-Rex has um, historically the strongest jaw of any creature known to walk the earth? Or did you know that the, the number of bones in a T-Rex is, is pretty close to the number of bones in the human body, but obviously the size difference, you wouldn't imagine that. Um, I'm going to stop myself there because I could keep going and get very excited. I like dinosaurs. I, I just, I just do. I just do. They're great. I think I saw, uh, I saw a show on uh, a documentary, I think on uh, discovery, maybe some time ago. And I, I think they were um, comparing various, you know, creatures that used to live uh, or at least they just, thought they lived in uh, you know prehistoric times and they were comparing them and i think there were there were also uh, dinosaurs and they tried they were trying to compare them with uh, also uh, living uh, creatures and yes to see the power of the jaw and <laughs> the mm. claws and everything yeah it's we uh, start it... applying so many things like we start trying to compare the t-rex to things that live now like I don't know, a saltwater, saltwater <laughs> crocodile or something, when actually the, the genetically T-Rexes are much closer to a chicken. Yeah. The, a lot of the things. Like, yeah. It just blows your mind how evolution <laughs> yeah. works. I just, yeah. I also had a, a very heated argument the other day with somebody who was saying <clears throat> something to do with, you know, Brachiosaurus and, and the, the sauropods, you know, the big, big ones, um, herbivores, mm -hmm. saying that they wouldn't have existed because they would have been crushed under their own weight. And I just didn't understand, like, how can you, how can you say this creature that we have actual fossilized evidence of <laughs> yeah, did didn't not exist, exist because yeah. it breaks, it breaks your view of the world. It breaks your brain. So it can't be real. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> don't don't deny these creatures existence they were amazing also they're not anywhere close to us now like this huge spans of time between so if you if you're scared of them begs the question as to why i love dinosaurs i'm gonna yeah i, I could yeah i'm gonna be really <laughs> careful because i have an encyclopedia of dino knowledge that i could be sharing with you right now <laughs> okay then i'll stop you there <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, Emily. I think um, from all of our, all of this talk that we had, I think uh, we have some important takeaway that dialogue is very important when it comes to anything in life, especially uh, in case of autism and not necessarily in any other case, uh, because only through dialogue we can generate understanding and we can generate some uh, shifts in mindset you know Definitely. and um, i think it's important to be able to ask questions and to be open to listen when someone else talks because usually you know we are so consumed in uh trying to figure out what to answer and not mm -hmm. you know to 
actually yeah. listen. Thinking about what you're going to say next yeah. rather than what's yeah. actually being said to you. Yeah. I completely agree. The only thing that I throw in there as well, and this is for holistic people and autistic people alike, is the road to redemption is so important. I see this a lot. I see it particularly around times of the year, you know, April when we're talking about autism awareness month <clears throat> and um, things can get so heated. And as soon as you're arguing, like properly, not, not debating, but arguing fervently and fiery, you're not going to get anywhere because you're turning off that person that you're trying to change their mind and you can't go at things in an aggressive way. And I think that that feeds into this idea of the road to redemption. You've got to give people an accessible route back to your way of thinking. You've got to allow them to come to the conclusion and then not feel like they have to stick to their guns to save their face, for want of a better analogy. Um, you've got to make it so that they feel like they can come back over to your side if they're wrong about a thing and if they're ready to accept that they're wrong and you're still at them you know I, yeah I, I would like us to avoid doing that especially around discussions about autism because there's you know it it's difficult because a lot of people a lot of autistic people feel like they've been harmed by misinformation and it's true but the only way to stop the spread of misinformation is by bringing people back over to our side of thinking. And you can't do that through aggression. So. Yes, yeah. it's uh, uh, an honest and open communication that implies mutual respect and acceptance. I think this is mm -hmm. what needs to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Emily. I will uh, leave my listeners with one final note. Get to where you want to be one story at a time. Emily, I think your uh, personal story is a beautiful lesson of accepting and loving oneself with kindness and patience. And what I wish for you is to uh, to have every day a jar filled with as many spoons as you need. Yes, <laughs> and that the is little, what I need. <laughs> and a little extra just for comfort. <laughs> you know. Thank you very much, Emily. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the emails so you can be notified when the next videos are uploaded. You can find all the necessary details in the description below.